Well, when you think of the Christmas story, when you think of the Christmas story, what do you think of? Kids, you might think of gifts or Santa Claus, Christmas trees, but when you think of the biblical story, what are the images and things that come to your mind in the Christmas story? Perhaps you think of Mary, a pregnant Mary, some upset parents, some people trying to make sense of all of that. Perhaps you think of Joseph, perhaps you think of the trip to Bethlehem, seeing some shepherds, a manger with a child in it, some cattle, some shepherds, some angels singing. Perhaps that's the picture that you think of when you think of the biblical story of Christmas. When you think of the biblical story of Good Friday and Easter, what are the images that come to mind in those stories? Maybe it's palm branches or the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus sweats blood or his arrest or Judas or the flogging or the carrying of the cross or the death of Jesus on a cross or an empty tomb. You see, we, when we read Scripture, we see the biblical account from, with earthly eyes. And it's a right and good biblical account that we see with earthly eyes and have the images that we see in our head that are right and good. And yet, did you know that there is a, a heavenly perspective that we get in Scripture and we see it through the tapestry of Scripture? We see this heavenly apocalyptic Christmas and Easter that's told from the perspective of heaven in the midst of a cosmic battle that's been raging before time began. Anybody want to hear that Christmas story? I guarantee you, you've never heard a Christmas story on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or Easter from Revelation 12, have you? Revelation 12, though, is this apocalyptic Christmas and Easter told from the perspective of a cosmic battle. Sounds like a good movie somebody needs. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, and we'll see this age-old cosmic conflict with the eternal stakes that are on the line. And as you turn there, I would just say the importance of this in this passage, there's a couple of things to me that stick out. You're reminded once again of a couple of things. You're reminded of how much the evil one hates God, hates the Son, and hates you. But you're also reminded in this passage that God has been keeping his word to his Son and his people longer than you can even imagine. We saw last week. This forward-looking look at the very end of the age where there are two witnesses that are going forth and sharing the gospel at high cost to themselves. And then we saw this interesting, beautiful phrase in the last chapter where we see the seventh trumpet blow, looking at the end of time when Jesus returns and the seventh trumpet blows and Jesus returns. And the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of of his Christ. And there's this beautiful transition of power at the second coming of Jesus. And today we're going to see this cosmic battle that leads up to the end that's been going on since before time even began. And we're going to see Satan's attempt to thwart the plans of God to even bring about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. We're going to see that God's plans remain. We're going to see what happens at the cross from heaven's perspective in this conflict and what was won at the cross. And then we're going to be reminded that the evil one, though defeated, he's still loose. God still has purposes for him in his eternal plan, and he's still loose, and he's still dangerous for us as the body of Christ. I don't know, I, I want to pause just for a second because I feel like much of the book of Revelation has been talking about the supernatural, has it not? And I'm sharing truths from God's word that things that will happen that are true, and sometimes the temptation is to go, that's kind of sci-fi for me. I'm not sure that really happens. And yet God continues to bear out through history, that what he says will happen will happen. And as a believer in Christ, that you can trust in his word, even in the book of Revelation, that is difficult and hard. I'm going to show you what God is doing, that he's been kept keeping his word. But along the way, there's some really incredible truths 
just for your everyday life in the midst of this cosmic battle. Revelation 12, 1 through 17. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then I'm going to break it down into three parts so you can better understand this text this morning. Verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head a crown of 12 stars, and she was pregnant. Picture this. And was crying out with birth pangs and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. So a woman who's pregnant, red dragon with seven heads and set ten horns and his heads of seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore the child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child. One who is to rule all the nations. There's Christmas. With a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had placed been, a place prepared by God. In which she is to be nourished for 1260 days, three and a half years. Verse 7. Now a war rose in heaven. Michael, angel, and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. And the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. Have you ever felt there, been there? And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. There's Calvary. And by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman had been given the two wings of great eagles. That picture so that she might fly from the serpent to the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to, to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river to the dragon it poured out of his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commands of our God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. You got all that? You figure all that out? That's what I was doing all week. Let me take it in bite sizes here for us. Verses 1 really through 5, I think you see this truth. I'll give you the truth and then I'll unpack it, okay? The truth is this. God's promise and delivery of Christmas declared war on the evil one. Do you see it there in verse 5? Do you see this woman who gives birth amidst the dragon trying to get the child, gives birth to a male child, one is, who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron? That comes directly out of Psalm chapter 2 where God is describing his son when the nations rage that he will shepherd he will shepherd the nations. He will rule over them as a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd cares for the sheep, but he also takes the wolves and puts them out. That's the picture. And you look at this, and the picture is this, that Satan failed to thwart God's plan and to send Messiah, the child born of the woman, to rescue man from what? To rescue us from our sin. There's two signs. Do you see them in verses 1 through 6? Two great signs. The first one is the woman. And when you see the phrase the woman, you see it all the way through this text. There's actually, a, I, would, I would say there's multiple thoughts going here, on here with the woman. Surely it points to the birth of Christ with his mother Mary. But it doesn't end there. It surely points to that, but it's beyond that. There's so much, I, I, I wish I had more time. I wish I had two hours today. 
You're like, no, sorry, I'm out. There's so much Old Testament biblical imagery here. I, could, I would love to walk through it with you. But in the first six verses, there's like six or seven direct cross-references to the Old Testament that you could draw out. But when you see the woman, and look at the first description there in verse 1, she is clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. That's almost a direct quote. From Genesis chapter 37, do you remember when Joseph... The youngest brother had two dreams. The first dream was, hey, my brothers are going to bow down to me. I think the delivery of that dream to his brothers probably didn't go off so well. But guess what? That, was a, that dream became true, did it not? His brothers did come to Egypt and bow down before him. The second dream has this imagery of a woman and 12, specifically 12 stars. And the dream points to Jacob's 12 sons. It points to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so there's a sense in which you can look at this text and see the woman who's pregnant with the male child, Jesus. But you also, broader than that, and we're going to get to more of this later in this, in this chapter, the woman represents the people of God. All the way through the Old Testament, what you see is that you see Israel pictured in their sin and in their trouble you see Israel pictures as a woman in distress, waiting for the one who would come from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, from the house of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, who would deliver the people of Israel. It, it's the people of God. And later in the chapter, at the end, you're going to see the woman and Satan coming after the woman and the rest of her offspring, those who follow God. And so you see this woman, and then you see this great red dragon. I'm going to have some nightmares tonight about a woman and a dragon. A dragon. Who is this? This is Satan. You see it later in the text. This serpent, the devil, and Satan, the deceiver. This is the dragon. This language this language, this picture of seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems, comes directly out of Daniel 7. Daniel 7 gives us the four different beasts. And the fourth beast, Daniel can't figure out who it is, and it's Satan who will come and rule. And so this dragon, and what does this dragon do? He's swept away a third of the stars of heaven. That's straight out of Isaiah chapter 14, if you're writing it down. Got a lot of places for notes there. Isaiah 14, which gives us the fall of Satan, where he takes a third of the angels, now demons, and takes them with him when he falls from grace. But this dragon is pictured, do you see it there in verse 4? He's pictured next to the woman. Go with me in your Bible to the first book of the Bible. And you're going to see where we see the picture of a woman and a serpent. Some of you know where we're going. In Genesis chapter 3, this is where Adam and Eve fall into sin. The serpent, the devil of old, you see in chapter, in Revelation, the same chapter we just read, the serpent. He shows up in the garden, Adam and Eve. God put, puts Adam and Eve in the garden. They're in fellowship with God, and then he tempts them. And they fall into sin. And then you see all the different things that happen as a result of sin. You see what happens to the serpent. He crawls on his belly. You see what happens to the woman and the man and the earth. All these cursings. There's seven of them in chapter 3. And so God is talking to the serpent who deceived. To the evil one who deceived. In verse 14 it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Satan, Cursed are you above all livestock, a beast of the field. Your belly you shall go, dust you eat. And then he says this, look at verse 15. I, this is God, I will put enmity. It's just a fancy word for conflict. Strife. I will put conflict between you, serpent, devil, and the woman. In this case, we're, we only have one so far. So Eve, but representative forward. And between your offspring your being the serpent's offspring, and her offspring. When you get to the book of Galatians, you see the seed of the flesh and the, and the spiritual seed of God. 
and they're at conflict, believers and unbelievers. That's the implication here. So you're going to have tension between those offsprings. And then it says this, her offspring, it says, he shall bruise you on the head. That's the offspring, the final offspring that the Old Testament talks about, the Messiah. He will bruise you on the head. A head wound is a fatal wound. Who's he? It's the Messiah bruising the head of the serpent. And you shall bruise him, serpent, on the heel. Think about the cross. Christ died, but he didn't. This is the first picture of the gospel of Jesus, the first kind of embryonic picture, nine verses after the fall of man. Functionally, what this is, is a promise from God that he will deal with sin, the sin of Adam and Eve that spreads to the whole human race eventually through a son, a son of the woman from the seed. Interestingly, he's talking to Adam and Eve. So when you get to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, you see some more kids, don't you? Who do you see? You see Cain. Did you know the name Cain means the acquisition? You're like, that doesn't sound like a good name for Cain. He didn't do so well. I think... What likely, this is my take, what likely happened is Adam and Eve are looking at this promise from Genesis 3 and they're saying, the next child's going to be the one. Because Abel is names, means vanity. Sorry if anybody's name means Abel. My name's Seth. I was the replacement. Anyway, (laughs) that didn't come off so well. (laughs) But what do you see? God comes and says, Cain, sin is knocking at your door. It's a picture of the evil one, isn't it? He's there. What is he trying to do to the line of the woman that comes first from Eve? He's trying to destroy it. And God raises up the appointed one, Seth, and you see the line of Christ. You can go back and see the line of Christ continues, right? And so Satan's still at work trying to destroy the line that leads up to the woman who will give us Messiah. And if you look all the way through the Old Testament, you see this battle going on behind the pages, don't you? You see Pharaoh trying to do what to the Hebrew babies? He's trying to kill them, and Moses escapes. Satan trying to kill the line up to Messiah. You see it with Saul trying to kill King David. Where is the line coming from? It's coming from David. You see it with Haman. Remember Haman's plot to kill genocide of the Jews? And you see Esther and even King Mordecai. The time of Jesus comes. The time Messiah is to be born. What's happening? Herod does what? He hears from the wise men about the Messiah, and he says, let me come and worship. Did he want to worship? He didn't want to worship. He wanted to kill anyone who was going to come after his throne, and he had the children, two and under, male children killed. You don't think there's a demonic forces going on through the Old Testament all the way through the line of Christ? That's what we're seeing. And yet, God protects his son all the way through the Old Testament to be born of a virgin, to be born Emmanuel, God with us. Quite a storyline, isn't it? See, Satan has failed in his attempts, and God comes through, and he gives us, through the birth of his son, the one who would shepherd the nations, who would rule. David Platt said it this way. He said, the birth of Christ on that day in Bethlehem inaugurated the death of this ancient serpent just as it had been promised In Genesis chapter 3, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the length in which God will go to take care of sin. The length in which God will go to restore his own to himself, to believe, to have forgiveness. Do you see the length that God will go to? We haven't even talked about the fact that it's his son that he gave us. I want you to think about the gifts of Christmas that you receive and you get. Parents, I want you to think about maybe a gift that it took moving hell and earth to get 
to your house through Amazon or wherever else. Think about that gift that took so long and it got lost 15 times, but you finally got it. I want you to think all of the turmoil that the gift of Christmas, the true gift of Christmas, went through to be brought to you. That Satan is trying to thwart the plans of God, but God comes through and delivering the gift to you and me. Let me ask you this question in view of that. As a believer in Christ, if you know Christ, what length will you go to to declare war on your sin? Think about the length that God has gone to to take care of your sin. Are you willing to wage war against the sin that still easily entangles us? Do you do it with the same intensity in which God has fought for you? The New Testament is really clear. We have to wage war. We have to wage war on our sin that easily entangles us, that we need one another to do it. What is it in your life right now? What sin do you need to make war on, that you need to declare war on right now, rather than being comfortable with it? And I want to tell you, you need your brothers and sisters to help you in it. And that's one of the hardest steps, isn't it? To let somebody know, this is going on in my life. It's humbling. It may even feel humiliating, but this is the way God has equipped us for, to help one another fight our sin, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters that you trust. We've seen the picture of this cosmic battle from the garden to the manger, but I want to move the scene forward to Calvary. You see, if Christmas declares war on the evil one, then Calvary, here's your next thought, at Calvary, Jesus won the decisive battle against the evil one. Amen? He won the decisive battle long ago against the evil one. There are other battles. Look at verses 7 through 9. It says, a war rose in heaven. You see Michael, and you see the angels fighting the dragon, defeating the dragon. It's interesting because people don't know what to do with this. I'm not sure I know where in the timeline this is. Some people look at this and say it's the same ancient battle where Satan fell. But the implication is there's the cross, and so I don't think it's there. Other people look at this text and say, well, it happened at the cross or around the time of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Some people look at it as part of the tribulation, that this is happening at the end of time. I, I kind of think it's around the time of the cross and the resurrection, but I don't know for sure. But the point either way is still the same. The result is clear, isn't it? The result is Satan is defeated. The result is, is Christ, look at it there, authority and power over the evil one. Who's the accuser? Do you see that word? He's the accuser. And it's interesting if you go back, for example, in the book of Job, it makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it, when we see that Satan goes before God in the heavens. You're like, he's not supposed to be there. But apparently, it looks like at least for a time, Satan could go to the throne of God. And you know what he does at the throne of God? Like, a, like a, a lawyer defending, and he has a case against any of us. And he's saying, they're guilty, they're guilty, they're guilty. And because of the blood of the cross, because Calvary happened, he can no longer accuse he can no longer go before the heavenlies. He can no longer go before the throne of God and be an accuser anymore. He lost his license, if you will. Isn't that great? I want you to look at a couple of passages. Jesus says it, and then the apostle Paul will say, what happened in the cosmic battle at the cross, what actually transpired there? In John chapter 12, Jesus says this. He's about to go to the cross, and he's speaking to some people, and he answers them. He says, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. And then verse 31, he says this in chapter 12. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be, what's the word? Cast out. 
Because of the cross, Jesus has disarmed Satan. Look at Colossians chapter 2. This gives us even more clarity. Verse 13, And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of the flesh, God made alive together with him, that's Christ. These people, he's talking to Colossians about their salvation, having forgiven us all our trespasses by, how did he do it? Look at verse 14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, meaning you can't be justified before a holy God because your sin sets in that record of debt. You can't do it on your own. You can't cancel that debt. And then it says this, he set aside. We don't set aside. Nailing it to the cross. He disarmed. This is what happened at the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. The record of debt is canceled because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. See, Jesus won the decisive battle in the cosmic battle against the evil one at the cross. If you think about war, any war has a decisive battle. If you think of World War II, most people say the decisive battle of World War II was the Battle of the Bulge. All the Allied troops, the British, the U.S., and France were moving forward into Germany in a line, and the Germans said, we have to make a push. And in the forest, in the winter of 46, they make a hard push right at the 101st Airborne. And they push through, and the reason they call it the Battle of the Bulge is because they did push through a ways. And yet reinforcements came to that bulge from the north. You had Patton's army come, and the rest of the Allied forces cinched up the bulk. But there was heavy, heavy casualties for the Allied troops. It looks like over 75,000 troops, 25,000 Americans, in the matter of a month, died in the Battle of the Bulge, the decisive battle. And yet, they win. And if you've ever seen Band of Brothers after that point, there's a lot of celebration, isn't there? The war's not over, but they're celebrating. They know that victory is in hand. And so let me ask you this morning about the Christian life. If the decisive battle happened at the cross, and we live a couple thousand years after that, and we rightly understand the scriptures, how should we then live? How should we live if the, dec the decisive battle is already won? Do we live like C Satan, even though still loose, is a defeated enemy? Or do we sometimes, or quite often, see the accuser of the brethren accusing us over and over and over again, and us letting him do that? He only has power if we give it to him. I don't know about you, but times where I am in sin, that voice in my head, the evil one, that voice in my head that says you're worthless, the voice in my head that says you keep coming back to this over and over and over to discourage you, to shame you, to show your guilt, even if they're true and they're not lies, the number one tool of the enemy, still, it isn't just disqualifying you, even though he wants to disqualify you, it is discouragement. It is being the accuser in your ear to tell you how unfit you are, what a bad Christian you are. But notice what's going on here. He's defeated. The decisive battle in your life has already been won as well. The power of sin is broken. The presence of sin remains. But the power of sin is broken. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I need to get living like that, don't you? As heavy as it is and as hard as the struggle of sin and the world and the brokenness of the world is, the decisive battle, biblically speaking, has already been won against the evil one. He does not have power over you. Watch the way he tries to accuse you even though he has no power. Satan knows his time is short, though. Do you see it there? He knows in verse 12 his time is short, and he's still loose. And so your third thought this morning is this, and you really 
we really need to understand this as we live today. A defeated but still loose enemy is the most dangerous kind of enemy, isn't it? If you want to go back to World War II, some of the most brutal things that happened with the Germans and the Japanese happened late in the war when they knew they were defeated. The kamikaze pilots who dive-bombed on naval vessels, they knew it. They knew that they were a defeated foe, but they wanted to inflict as much damage as possible as a defeated foe. And maybe you're not into war, so let me give you a movie. You ever seen The Dark Knight, Batman? Here we go. Bruce Wayne is trying to figure out what the motivation of the Joker is. What is he after? Why is he doing this? And old Alfred, remember Alfred? Down in the research lab, he tells a story to Bruce to get him to listen. He tells a story of how he was in Burma and there were these bandits, these tribal leaders, and they were trying to pay these tribal leaders off with rubies and diamonds and gold so they could do what they wanted to do in their areas that they control. But what they began to notice is that their caravans would still not make it through. The bandits would still destroy them. And he tells the story, and he gets real close to Bruce, and he's like, and he says to him, and one day this little boy had a, had a diamond as big as a tangerine in his hand. And what we discovered was is all the things we were trying to give these tribal leader, this tribal leader to bribe them with didn't work. And then he looks at Bruce and he says this, some men just want the world to burn. Can I tell you that's exactly what Satan wants? He's a defeated foe. He just wants the world to burn he hates you. He hates your unbelieving friends as well. He wants your life wrecked. He wants your marriage to fail. He wants you living in sin and discouragement. But what does God want? What does God want for you in this passage? Look at verse 14 through 17. Look at the beautiful picture of what God wants for you in the midst of this. He wants your protection and care and nourishment. It's a massive contrast here. Satan wants wrath on these earth dwellers, verse 12, at his hands. And God wants protection and nourishment. Look at it. Verse 13, what is Satan doing? He's pursuing the woman. I think here it's just the offspring of the woman. It's believers in Christ. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it's believers in Jesus. You ever wonder to just stop for a minute and say, you ever want, wondered, rationally speaking, why in the world that we live in, Christians are as persecuted as they are compared to other faiths? It doesn't make rational sense. It's just demonic. At the end of the day, it's demonic. And from Genesis 12 on, if you want to ask and answer the question, and this is just a general comment. If you want to ask and answer the question, who have been the most oppressed people on the planet as an ethnic group? Who is it? It's the Jews. From millennia and millennia, and you come to 2024, even in our culture, who is hypersensitive and even names racism in a way that's not racism, but hypersensitive to racism in general, right? And yet, alive and well is the anti-Semitism everywhere here in 2024. And let's just call it racism because that's what it is. Why is that? There's no explanation beyond this is just de demonic. There's demonic. Satan hates. He hates believers. He hates unbelievers all the same, but especially the people of God. And yet God here shows his love. Do you see it? You see in verse 13, the dragon's pursuit of the worm woman, but then 
and 14, but the woman who was given two wings of the great eagle. What a, in the Bible, eagle's wings, what do they do? They, they protect. They care. Isaiah 40, 31, he takes us up in eagle's wings. You ever see Lord of the Rings? When Gandalf and the dwarves are always in trouble, what shows up? It's the eagles. They always show up to bail them out and catch them, literally, protect them, care for them, heal them. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? This is why the hatred of the evil one, the love and protection and care and nourishment of the Father that you see here, this is why the Bible says to us in the New Testament, put on the armor of God. You got an enemy. Resist the evil one. Pay attention, right? So here's the question. Are you staying under the covering that God has for you? How does God's covering work? We get out of the covering when we sin against him and we venture out from where the covering is in our lives. You guys, this week we had a pretty crazy storm, didn't we? I don't know how you fared or how many trees you lost or how long... Your power was out, some of you. I went down to Houston yesterday. It was, it, was, it was bad in Houston. Most of the people that were at a graduation party and most of the people there were saying, hey, this happened to my house, that happened to my house. Uh, we still don't have power. When you think about a storm, I was outside when this thing hit and I had to walk from our back house to our house and I'm like, I gotta get inside. Because in a storm, you need covering. You need shelter. You need a refuge. And this is what God provides to his people here. And I think this last section is at the end of time in the great tribulation where God is protecting his people from the wrath of the one who's defeated, the one enemy who is still dangerous. We need covering. So are you staying under the covering of God from the evil one? And look, if you look at this passage, what does the evil one really hate? He really hates those who keep the commands of God and the testimony of Jesus. That's believers in Christ who are walking in obedience. Interestingly enough, how, what does it look like in the New Testament for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, for us to be enabled by the Holy Spirit? The Bible says that we yield to the Spirit, and he fills us with the Spirit. And that's not some ecstatic, emotional thing. Do you know what it is? It's when we're walking and yielding to God in obedience, he fills us for ministry. He fills us in obedience to him. I know that's not a sexy look, but that's what it looks like to walk closely with God. You want to walk close to God, you obey him. You pursue holiness to God, and he covers you and protects you. So how are we doing? How are we doing? Are we pursuing holiness in our walk with Christ that he might cover us? Or are we venturing out into the storm and being exposed to the temptations of the evil one? What holes do you have in your holiness? Again, we're the body of Christ. We care for one another as God cares for us. One of my favorite Christmas hymns, favorite Christmas hymns written by Charles Wesley. We sing it most every year. Maybe it's because I'm like, we got to sing this. I don't know. You know where I'm going. <laughs> Come thou long expected Jesus. Charles Wesley wrote that hymn Christmas hymn for the first advent of Jesus, but he also wrote it thinking about the second advent because when you read the words or sing the words, it would apply to both. Let me give them to you. I'm not going to sing. Luke, you can come over here. Just kidding. <laughs> he will. Look at these words. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let, our fi let us find our rest in thee. See that in this passage? Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own eternal spirit, rule in all of our hearts alone. And here's, look, check this punchline. 
by thine all-sufficient merit, what Christ did on the cross, raise us to thy glorious throne. It applies to the first advent. It applies to the second advent. So what do we see in this passage? It's a panorama. This passage is a panorama of this cosmic conflict, this promise of a son in the Garden of Eden right after we sin against God, the turmoil that comes all the way from the Old Testament all the way to the birth of Christ at Bethlehem, which declares war on the evil one through much suffering in his life up to the point of the cross and the resurrection where Jesus wins the disciples decisive battle, and yet we've said this too, even though the decisive battle is won, that the enemy is still loose, that he's still a dangerous enemy to us, so we resist him, so we stay covered under the shadow of God's wings through the Spirit's work in our life, but one day, it's not in the text, but you need to hear it, but one day, the trumpet will sound. The trumpet will sound and Jesus will return and he will throw Satan and the demons in the lake of fire and he will win. He will win completely. But until that day, until he raises us to his glorious throne, as this hymn would say, your takeaway is this, find refuge in the shadow of his wings. Fighting sin Dismissing the accusations of the evil one that comes to you, covered from the enemy's storm. Let me pray. Father, what a text that you remind us of this cosmic battle that is going, and yet you, from eternity past to now, are fighting battles that you've already won that you declared war on the evil one through your son's coming, that you won the decisive battle, sin and death and forgiveness on a cross, and yet, yet you remain with us through your spirit as we battle between now and the second coming of Jesus. But we long for that. We long for Jesus' coming, that all things would be made right, But until then, we know we have a great God with great power to walk with us, to care for us. You give us other saints in your church to encourage us, to build us up, that we might sing of the greatness of who you are. We love you, and we thank you for time and your word this morning. In Jesus' name.